Wow, I didn't even have to get everyone quiet. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. So welcome to Cardozo Law and this, the what is going to be an amazing two-day conference event entitled Catalyzing Change, Intersectional Feminist Practice in International Justice, Sexual and Gender-Based Crimes in Angwen. This event is co-organized and could not have happened without the Cardozo Law Institute in Holocaust and Human Rights and Bruna specifically. So wherever she is, we need to give her a round of applause. <laughs> the Emergent Justice Collective, Talawa Justice for Women, and the Global Justice Center. And it's also supported by UN Women and the Cardozo International and Comparative Law Review. So today we're planning a discussion of the recent Angwen Appeals decision from December 15th, 2022 at the International Criminal Court. And we hope to demonstrate the ways in which the court's ruling impacts intersectional feminist approaches to international justice, as well as redress for international crimes and especially gender-based crimes for survivors in Uganda in present context and survivors around the world that are seeking justice for international crimes. We'll begin with an opening conversation with Patricia Visor Sellers, Victoria Nyanjura, and Sarah Kihika Kasande. I'm going to let them introduce themselves and the organizations in which they represent, not represent today, but in which they work. And we will begin with this conversation to really set the context for the rest of today's panels and tomorrow's events as well. So please give me a hand in welcoming every one of our panelists. The other thing I'm just going to mention is that everyone needs to speak into the microphone for the benefit of those online. They won't be able to hear all of the background noise. So also feel free to, to speak outside of the microphone and know that you won't be on online, okay? Thank you very much, Jocelyn. Is my microphone on? Okay. Now can everyone hear me online? All right. Well, good morning. Uh, it is quite a pleasure to be here, but I'm going to get a bit more dramatic. I think it's historical to be here because I think the intervention of uh, feminist international lawyers and the submissions by the Office of the Prosecution and other Amici was a historical moment. Before I continue with that, let me introduce myself. I'm Patricia sellers Viseur. I'm the Special Advisor for Slavery Crimes at the International Criminal Court to the Office of the Prosecutor. I'm also a professor at Oxford University on the law faculty. And today I have joining me a wonderful panel. And again, as Jocelyn said, we'll allow uh, self-introductions. And so I'll turn to my immediate left, I'm, it's my right, I'm left-handed, so I always get them mixed up, Wakanda forever, to my, uh, to Victoria. Would you please introduce yourself first? Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm honored to be here today. My name is Victoria Nyanjura. I'm a Ugandan, and I flew all the way from Uganda to participate in this event. Uh, what should I tell you about myself? I'm a survivor. I'm currently heading a school where some survivors go to school. But more so, I am the founder of Women in Action for Women, a survivor group founded by survivors and working with survivors. Then I also am also on the leadership council of the membership, council for the Global Survivor Network. I can't wait to see how this discussion goes because it's just about us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victoria. Now I'll turn to Sarah. Thank you, Patricia. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you to the organizers for uh, inviting me and also inviting the team from Uganda to be part of this conversation here. My name is Sarah Kihika Kasande. I'm a human rights lawyer. I work for the International Center for Transitional Justice. I'm the Uganda head of office. 
And uh, for the last uh, 11 years, I've been working on uh, transitional justice in Uganda, but in also other emerging contexts, South Sudan, the Gambia, Tunisia, and Kenya. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let me get back to the bit of history that I referred to earlier. And that was the intervention into the appeals brief regarding the Ongwen appellate judgment. What occurred was that we had a trial where Ongwen was convicted of several counts that related to sexual violence. But then the appeals chamber, during their process of reviewing the judgment, asked that Amici enter in, in particularly on specific issues that related to sexual, gender-based violence, sexual slavery, forced pregnancy, uh, the issue of forced marriage, and the issue of duress. And the call was met. The call was met in a stunning fashion, I think, by many international lawyers around the world, but in particular, the call was met by over 18, I believe, international feminist lawyers. We will be speaking about this appellate process of responding as Amici, but also about the judgment throughout the conference. Uh, today, what I would like to say is that we will begin our discussion much more with the situations that occurred in Uganda that not only stimulated the appeals process, but much more the trial process, but much more the living experiences of persons who were in Uganda. I think that many people who now are engaged in international criminal law, and particularly those who are feminist lawyers, remember the Akiesu amicus brief. So really, Ongwen gave us a chance to not recreate, but to continue a conversation with the appeals chamber. It is a rare event that an appellate chamber asks in particular for the input from feminist international lawyers, or I would say, on feminist international lawyers issues and subjects. This was a way that we were in conversation with the highest body at the court. This is a way that we visualized our issues, our legal strategies and our legal positions. Now, as I said that that judgment will be spoken about throughout the day, but what I would just like to say concerning that judgment is that it stands. It stands to have strengthened, I think the voice of women, but in particularly the voice of what we think international criminal law could be and should be, and that the conversations via submissions and via pleadings in court are a norm and should not be something that happens all of a sudden every 15 years. So what I would challenge and invite some of the people who are sitting in this very room who participated in that process, that we not wait for the appeals chamber to make a call for Amici, that we follow every appellate court decision, every trial decision, and that we act upon ourselves, that we use our own agency to enter in and become part of the conversation. That's my challenge to you as we can celebrate while we examine and while we critique the participation in the Ongwen appeals decision. But let me now turn to other issues, and in particular, I'd like to see if we can just situate the Ugandan conflict within Ugandan history so that we understand that the appellate decision was but a continuum of time and space, of events that came before it and that continue on. And for this right now, I'd like to turn to Sarah, if I could. And Sarah, could you give us some context in terms of Uganda, the Ongwen case within Ugandan history? Thank you, Patricia. Um, uh, again, it's a pleasure to be here. And I, 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 first, I would like also to thank the feminist lawyers that uh, filed the amicus brief um, in the Ongwen case. I believe it was a notable step in advancing jurisprudence, but also in acknowledging the totality of crimes that victim endures. Um, to understand the crimes that uh, Ongwen committed and was convicted for, it's important to understand the context in which they were committed. Um, Uganda is a country that has never had a peaceful transfer of power since we gained independence in 1962. 
armed conflict in different parts of the country has been more of a common characteristic. Um, in northern Uganda, particularly, this armed conflict started after the government of Yoweri Museveni took power. Now, drawing from Uganda's colonial history that was characterized by a policy of divide and rule, where ethnicity and identity were politicized and exploited, this continued. So the LRA war waged by Joseph Kony was a way of countering the new government that took power and in a way of the actually nationalism to, to reclaim possession of power. Of course, the counterinsurgency, the, the response of the government in itself was brutal and actually gave rise to further armed rebellions in other parts of, of Northern Uganda. Now, as I think recorded in the judgment, this war started in 1987 and lasted until 2006. Horrific atrocities were committed in that period. Of course, one of the most uh, defining characteristic of that uh, of this cry of the of this conflict was the abduction and forced conscription of young men and boys as child soldiers into the LRA ranks. Uh, one of these was Dominic Congwen, who was uh, a, a young boy going to school. His age is still in contention, whether it was 10 or 14, but nevertheless, he was still a minor who was going to school was abducted and that was a pattern that many went through, abducted and then taken to the LRA. At the time, the government's efforts to protect were more barbaric. People were forced into IDP camps, forced into very deplorable living conditions, forced to endure horrific atrocities and minimum efforts to try and limit the harms that they endured, they endured while the government itself continued committing these, uh, these crimes. But fast forward, when of course captured in 2015, brought before the, the ICC. And uh, the LRA was headed by Joseph Kony. It's important to note that much as Nguyen has been tried and convicted, the LRA is still at large. They're still, yes, it's much, much weakened, but it's still committing atrocities in the Central African Republic. So unfortunately, the atrocities of LRA are not over yet with the conviction of Ongwen. So Ongwen is just part of a bigger story of the LRA and Uganda's uh, inability to grapple with its history of conflict. Now with the trial of Ongwen, it opened up a conversation about what actually happened. Now, Uganda's history of conflict is one that had been shrouded in a lot of silence. The government policy about Northern Uganda was, let's not talk about it. Government military solution, let's provide amnesty without necessarily acknowledging the full extent of the crimes and violations that were being committed. So the ongoing trial, which was publicized. And I must uh, commend the ICC, specifically the registry for the efforts were wide broadcasting, screening to hear the narrative of what happened during those years. Of course, within the legal lens, which is narrow within the rules of the court, but nevertheless, it exposed to a certain extent, the patterns of crimes that had been uh, committed. So Ongwen's trial and his subsequent conviction really opens up a conversation about what is required to address the legacy of conflict and human rights abuses, but also the impact of the crimes that were committed by Dominic Ongwen, but also the LRA and the government of Uganda. So Ongwen's conviction is only part of the story. Thank you very much, Sarah. One of the issues that we will be discussing throughout the day are the different actors. And some of you present are judicial actors or practitioners belong to civil society or international organizations. Uh, I would like to say that um, I myself as a judicial actor right now, I'm acting in my personal capacity, not as a member of the office of the prosecutor. But I'd like to emphasize that actions have taken place on many levels over many time periods. And I think one, Victoria, is your formulation of women in action for women. Why was women in action for women set up 
what made you decide to do this within the context of Uganda? Thank you once again. Uh, as I said earlier, I'm a survivor. I returned from captivity. Several organizations were in place. And they did the welcoming, the immediate uh, need to take care of survivors. We were in groups. We told our stories. We petitioned the Parliament of Uganda because of the experiences or the challenges that we continue to face even after the war. So still I felt certain things were not yet happening. And uh, I thank God I had the opportunity to go to school. I started participating in events locally and internationally. But then I asked myself, for how long will you tell this same story where you sit in a conference and the best you can do is just to narrate what happened? What next can you do? So I came up with the idea, let me form Women in Action for Women. And the main purpose of that is to look at the economic empowerment of these women. Why did I look at the economic empowerment? It's easier, most of us talk about advocacy, which is very good, it's what lead to all these meetings, getting to know what is happening. But then for how long do you continue to tell this story? For how long will the women be there looking on and so forth? And the main idea was start this, work together with the women so you can start listening to them. Every time a survivor tells a story, there is the suffering, there is the message of hope, and there is something that states the strategy in which they think if that is done, would let them out of the situation they have gone through. I'll be wrong to say you can return back to that situation that you were in before abduction, but it can push you somewhere. So with Women in Action for Women, how do you look at the different angles? We started with one thing. When you look behind here, there is a quilt. Number one was for the members of WOW, Women in Action for Women, to tell their war story. Uh, the quills behind expresses different events or specific point that they wanted to state. Then after we did the COVID story and we are continuing to do different things. It's also this ground that I would like to thank here and guests is uh, here. He supported us in the process of uh, making sure we get all the requirements that is needed for the quills. And this shop is now online. So I think... Uh, Many people who are here, it would be nice to visit that site and be the common good for making these women have an a living. So look at the holistic approach in addressing the issues of survivor. That was the main reason for the formation of WOW. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Let me follow up with that. Um, could you tell me whether survivorship is something that's very punctual happens at one time in terms of identifying a survivor, or do those identity change over time? And if so, how? So the survivorhood is a process. For example, when I returned, I was that victim of abduction who had right to return from captivity. Thank God the organizations were already on ground, so I was identified as a victim putting us together, working with us over time. I get empowered and I start doing certain things. So I become a survivor. Actually, I'm beyond survivorhood. I am an activist. That's what I can say. But then for the... Thank you. Thank you. But then for the broader one, it, it takes time for survivor or somebody to be in that state. Why? Uh, when we returned, let me just use the personal perspective and that of the women that I work with. Uh, at that point, it was more or less like there are specific needs that we really wanted. Every day there was running. You couldn't have where to eat, where to sleep. So upon returning home, people were just excited that they could have a roof. Maybe they are in, in the reception center. You can sleep somewhere. The other needs were never thought of. Then as time goes, you realize that, okay, I'm at the reception center. Where am I going after here? You want to look at uh, 
think of your family members, there's maybe the family is there, others, their family is no more. So you start thinking of where am I going to put up? Uh, others now opportunities were there for some people to go back to school. And that is why me and some few women went back to school, but it is never the same. I had a supporting family. They took care of my two children I returned with. There are other women who didn't have where to leave these children. So her need will not be education. Her need will be where can she put up? What can she have to feed her children? I think uh, all I can say is uh, these things take time. It is important we walk from that moment and progress over time to really tell what is that immediate thing. It's never easy. But I think uh, to address situations, not just in Uganda, issues around the world, it is going to be important for the different actors to understand that uh, doing it right now will avoid other future currents. Because if I'm not fine, my child is not fine, it means the future generation is still not safe. And these situations will continue too. So in short, Patricia, there is no time in points. It takes time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, talking about situations continue, um, I think, Sarah, you were beginning to say that within the context of Uganda, Ongwen is, is but one line and a very important line. And in order for situations not to continue, what I would call the structural violence that leads to the necessity of intersectional approaches because the intersectionality are temporal vulnerabilities but that could continue but that are based upon I think as Patricia Harris Collins an African-American feminist has told us with her theory of the um, matrix of domination it's the structure of oppression that creates the vulnerabilities of intersectionality can you tell me what was your viewpoint or your position um during the armed conflict as someone who was in Kampala and not in the North at the time? Uh, thank you. Thank you for that question, uh, Patricia. Um, what many may not know is as the war in Northern Uganda ravaged for over 20 years, the rest of the country continued living like everything was normal. The Uganda, there's a part uh, in Northern Uganda called Karuma. For those of you who've had the privilege of coming, there's that river that divides. That bridge symbolically and physically actually divided the country. So it was a deliberate narrative of the government to maintain complete silence, but also to other the region. So the rest of the country continued. And uh, the media, of course, in a context of repression was also not uh, providing particular information to the citizens about to the rest of the country about the atrocities that were happening in northern Uganda. And the response was really left to the humanitarian actors. The only time we got to know more about what was happening in Northern Uganda is when government decided to issue amnesties. That's when it realized that the military solution had completely failed. Remember the conflict had started in 1987. The first amnesty were issued in 2000, but nevertheless, still there was that complete detachment. So as a Ugandan living in another part of the country, it is much later that we began realizing the full extent of the atrocities that had been committed in that country. And I think the government has tried to create some kind of exceptionalism to say, well, this is not what's happening in Uganda. As you know, at that time, Seven was being held for his macroeconomic policies, the rule of law development, while one segment of the entire country was going through the horrors of war and the government's response to those to, to, the, to the conflict and uh, the abuses was basically place people in conditions of almost concentration camps were very difficult living conditions. So it's, and it's that othering that continues to date, whereby the injustices in Northern Uganda are seen as aspects that happened in the past, in a part of a different country, that now the rest of the country should move forward. But as Nyanjura has mentioned, that these consequences endure, they are intergenerational. 
and it's you cannot completely wipe them under the carpet and ignore them because the consequences endure. And again, going back to the ongoing trial, that's why to me it's very significant in the sense that it drew, it shone a light on what happened and having the trial broadcast um, uh, both by ACC, the national media, and to have people hear what exactly happened, the patterns of abduction, the patterns of sexual abuse, and the continuing legacies of those violations. Now to create that national consciousness of what happened, but also what are those structural drivers? So the issue of marginalization, and I think in most post-colonial African states, ethnicity, identity, and marginalization are common characteristics that are at times exploited by the state. And they perpetuate these cycles. So accountability is one aspect to it, but tackling those structural drivers, why is a particular region in the country historically excluded? Why is it deliberately denied basic services, dignity protection by the government? So tackling that requires a broader approach. Accountability is just a process that draws attention to these issues. Thank you very much, because I, I think you've really gotten to different types of structures, such as just the denial of information for one part of the country, therefore the separation of even the feeling of, of, of being Ugandan of your citizens' rights, of knowing, of not being able to, to join together to confront uh, the different structural issues. And this certainly must impact, I think, on how even transitional justice is formulated today. I don't know, but maybe Victoria, you might want to speak to the transitional justice uh, process in terms of civil society in the North. How are you able to advocate as an activist now for transitional justice to be responsive if at times the government is in a type of denial about the atrocities uh, that occurred? Thank you, Patricia. First of all, I must say, uh, as uh, Victoria and uh, also on behalf of the initiatives on ground, I must say we participated in the draft in the drafting of the transitional justice policy in Uganda. Uh, several of us were involved. The only challenge that is there, like Sarah mentioned, is uh, when will it really ever be passed? And if it is passed, will it ever be implemented? So we only pray that one day something like that can be. But if on the participation, we did all we could. Uh, Sarah was actively involved. Our petition informed a lot in that uh, transitional justice policy. So as we sit here, for me, my humble request is to the different uh, actors when you discuss some of this at the intergovernmental level, uh, high level discussion within the NGOs, please task the rightful persons to do the needful because uh, the situation is real. And many of us have hope that maybe only the implementation of such would help to address something. Thank you. Why do you think that it has been difficult to have the bill passed? <laughs> I will speak on my own behalf. Uh, first of all, I, I, I think acknowledgement has never really been there, like where there has been no formal acknowledgement of certain things that happen. That makes it even harder to pass the bill and then think towards uh, the implementation. So I wish we could all be very honest in each and everything we do to speak the truth. For example, the international bodies also discuss with governments. This is not just Uganda, but do you get to task these key persons when you meet them to discuss reality? Or sometimes we cover up a few things and discuss the other unless we all own up these processes, we will never go far with the desired peace that we all want around the world. Thank you. So there's a responsibility on each and every actor at each and every level. 
in each and every geography. Yes, I think we all have, even us in the house, the academias, the universities play a lot. You send students out there to go do research. When they come back, their findings, they present, how do we, do we really try to implement all this and work around it, or it remains in papers? Then uh, when you meet these governments, uh, there, there are programs that is intergovernmental, NGOs and so forth. Do we really do it in a way where we feel whatever I'm doing is for the common good of us all? The peace in Uganda is for us all. The war in Southern Sudan affects each and every one of us indirectly. Thank you. I'd like to... I'd like to just turn to Mr. Ongwen because one of the uh, issues that came up uh, with in the appeals chamber of which they asked for assistance was the question of whether duress uh, was a, a proper, for lack of a better word, an available defense for Mr. Ongwen. And Sauer, there's been a lot of discussion in particular of the personal situation of Mr. Uh, Ongwen as a child soldier. But I was wondering, would you just address what you think some of the issues uh, that should be taken in consideration when one talks about duress of Mr. Ongwen? Um, uh, thank you, Patricia. And actually, before I get to that, I want to uh, briefly chip into what uh, Nyanjura was discussing and your question as to why the TJ process is not making headway. Uh, we have to understand the Ugandan context. Uh, this is not an ideal trans context in transition. So we have violations that occurred in the past still occurring. So the same government that has a mandate to address these violations is continuing this pattern of committing these violations. So there's that deliberate attempt to evade accountability, not just for the past, but also for the, for the ongoing. And I think for other contexts, it's important to understand that as time drags on, there's usually a deliberate attempt to ignore and deny certain atrocities that occur, the assumption that time will erase. So let's move on. Why, why do we still have to focus on what happened 20 years ago? Yeah, so th there's that deliberate effort to, to diminish, ignore, and erase. So that's what we're seeing in Uganda, and that really perhaps motivates the Uganda government's reluctance to implement the transitional justice policy. Now, moving to the question of duress, um, to me, the trial of Dominic Ongwen highlighted that the legal realm, the legal lens of handling issues of duress capacity often is not rooted in the social cultural realities. And it's understandable. And to me, the question of whether the law is better placed to address this is a completely different conversation. But of course, if in your northern Uganda, Dominic Ongwen, as I said, is a complex perpetrator, abducted at the age of 10 or 14, possibly conscripted into the LRA, witnessed horrific atrocities, but then went ahead to commit vicious atrocities. And like other abductees, he scaled the ranks, became a commander of one of the brigades, the senior brigade. Now, there are various factors, and I think the court tried to grapple with this. The court acknowledged this, that he is a person who is also being convicted for crimes of which he may have also suffered. I mean, given it acknowledged his, uh, his abduction and what happened to him. But of course, again, the narrow realm of law. So for example, the LRA used spirituality. Spirituality in the sense that Dominic Ongwen, I mean rather Joseph Coney was seen as an individual with ethereal powers, uh, often demonstrating, and again, Nyandura here and others may be better placed to offer examples of this, where the LRA would evade the UPDF. So when the UPDF would be about to attack, Coney would, mobilize his troops and they would escape. And uh, then he would say, you see, I had a vision the previous day. So 
my, uh, the indoctrination of young people, and it was, it was a systematic approach. Young men and girls are abducted, indoctrinated into the LRA philosophy and treating Connie as a supernatural being, and made to believe that if they did anything that did not comply with Connie, then they faced fast, uh, harsh repercussions. And one of the first steps of indoctrination was to make sure that they witness brutality first hand right? Um, whether it is the brutal whippings, whether it is the gruesome murders of a 10-year-old uh, 10 or 15-year-old witnessing that, that has a lasting impact. Now, we are told that uh, as you grow, you reach the age of 18, automatically you're supposed to switch and become someone who is able to comprehend, to ignore all that socialization, indoctrination that occurred and suddenly become a person that has this moral lens, understands what's right or wrong. This is not to excuse what Dominic Ongwen did. This is to say that it's more complex. And again, he, his, brutal, his crimes were brutal and vicious, and indeed his conviction was justified. The testimony was there. But it's important to understand that perhaps the legal realm does not adequately understand or is not equipped that the tools within the judicial process of comprehending the, what duress means in such a context, in such a context where spirituality, cultural norms, and various aspects of that socialize an individual how that shapes a person's ability to form criminal intent is also one aspect that may not be considered in, in a court of law. But to me, the, the, this trial opens up that conversation. What is duress? And can we use a Western lens to determine what duress is when determining Dominic Kongwen's actions in the LRA? Thank you very much. And then, Victoria, I'd like to ask you, in terms of um, uh, Mr. Ongren, Dominic Ongren, what are your thoughts about him as a person, but also as a perpetrator, but also for you as a citizen of Uganda who has lived a war-torn situation? Thank you so much. Uh, as someone, who was abducted. I also stayed in the LRA. I think I must say, as a person, is just a normal human being like I am. But in terms of looking at him as a perpetrator, we had a back and forth discussion. And as Sarah said, it's a mixed uh, feeling and reaction on ground, even among us survivors. But me and a few of us do say that uh, if we say the court must prosecute specific persons who could have led or done certain things beyond, it's important that the formal justice is also recognized or respected. Why? In one way or the other, those specific families that were aff affected by the actions that he committed need to feel that their plight has been their suffering was acknowledged and justice is being served to them. So to me, when I had the judgment, I was, I could say 50-50, I was okay with the judgment. Why? On the side of him being a perpetrator, he has been uh, charged on guilty and charged specific uh, crimes. But also the court was mindful to not give him like a, death penalty or life imprisonment, meaning there was a aspect of thinking on the side of him being a, a child who was also abducted. He rose up into the rank and did something. I think it's, it was a fair judgment to me. Why? It protects him when he gets back on ground. The day he goes back home, those who fail, he wronged them or committed crime will know he was punished for what he did to them. But on the other hand, uh, his family will also be able to reunite with him. I'm very sure the community will, will welcome him because not everyone was really against, but also there are people who are never happy about the judgment. And uh, to me, this is a fair justice. And if he's not prosecuted, then uh, it means commanders will always commit these crimes because they know you won't be held accountable anyway. 
the suffering was real. Yeah, that's what I can say. Thank you. Thank you for the honesty. Okay, we're going to conclude with um, a, one other question. Yesterday we had a, a discussion, and the phrase, the common good, what is the aim of all of these processes, transitional justice, the judicial system, the aftermath of war, and then the answer came that transitional justice should bring us a common good. Well, we were all grappling with, well, what is, or what could that common good be? So we've had a night to sleep and to think, okay? So I'm going to turn first to Sarah. What could be the common good of all of these problems? Um, to me, the common good would be making sure we have a society that does not create other dominicongwens. To me, that would be the common good. And how is that? It's by tackling those root causes that create circumstances of conflict, that create conditions where young men, boys and girls are abducted and turned into monsters as Dominic Conguen. Creating a society where structural inequality is addressed to make sure that segments of a society don't feel excluded. Of course, in the immediate, the common good of transitional justice would be for all those victims who suffered these atrocities and harms are able to get redressed, to have their citizenship affirmed and their dignity restored. But in the broader picture, I think the ultimate goal of uh, transitional justice should be to transform our societies to see that those underlying causes that create conditions for conflict and these mass atrocities are eliminated. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. I'll just add on to what Sarah said. That was in depth. So to me, common good, I know we are all working towards that common good for each and every one of us. But then how do we get to do it? Just be yourself. Do it in a transparent way. Be mindful that your action could affect one party elsewhere. So by being yourself, you're really going to do the right thing that you'd expect it to happen for you to you. So in this context on, tra on, on transitional justice policy or the implementation, let all of us appreciate that this is a tool this is a policy that could guide the processes that enables us build that community we desire to live in and work towards making sure we do it. And finally, don't leave those ones who have suffered. Let them be part of that process. Because from the initiation bit of it, through the implementation, in doing that for me, I think we will have done the common good that we all desire to do because there will be no harm. Thank you very much. And then I'll just end with maybe a very legal technical common good is that the appeals chamber issued a judgment and that a judgment specifically spoke to the facts of Uganda that we've discussed today and to Mr. Ongwen. But in one instance, one has to understand that that appellate judgment affects future cases. It has set standards. The crimes of Uganda, but also the adjudication of those crimes in Uganda now tell us how we can confront future crimes, whether they be within Europe, within Latin America, within North America, within Asia, or within Africa. Uganda will always be taken to the next situation because it will tell us what we do in the instance of forced pregnancies, in the instance of sexual slavery, enslavement, in the instances of duress, in the instances of forced marriage. So we are all going to continue, not only in this journey that is a very human one and that is a legal one, but is one that affects the international community of which, of which each one of us are a part. So I'd really like to thank my guests today 
and thank you very much for the conversation and thoughts that you have offered us. So we do maybe have five minutes or so for a couple of questions. There's one question in the chat that I wanted to direct toward Victoria from Tony Kirabira. It says, thanks for the insights and the great work you are doing in Northern Uganda. Do you think that traditional reconciliation systems have had any impact on the survivors? Thank you so much, uh, Tony. Uh, traditional reconciliation or justice uh, approach to some extent has had an impact to a smaller extent, let me say. Why do I say this? If I am in pain, you've done wrong to me. A lot has happened just making me go through a process of uh, reconcile with the other party will not work because the wound is real. So it's it's a component that contributes towards something, but I wouldn't want uh, to acknowledge that it's something that can really work so very great for the survivors. It should just be a contribution towards the overall healing process. Thank you. We have one more question. Uh, yes, my name is Ian Guest. Um, so I have a question for Victoria. Uh, you started off by talking about the importance of empowering survivors, and particularly from an economic perspective. I know there's going to be more discussion about reparations, but let me ask you, Victoria, as a, as a survivor, what is more important to you, having Ongwen uh, in jail and justice having been served, or getting proper reparations and putting these survivors back on their feet economically? I know that's a very unlegal question, but you know, I would like to know which is more important to you of the two. How would you grade them? How would you rank them? Justice or reparations? Thank you so much, uh, Ian. Uh, if you're reparated, then it means justice has been served to you. Though I also want to acknowledge that uh, you can never go back to that state in which you were, but it moves you somewhere and you're able to move on. Thank you. Okay, I think with that, we will conclude our opening conversation and then we'll take a 10 minute break and we'll come back for our next first panel. Okay, thank you.
Everyone stay secret. Good morning, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Like, good. Uh, so welcome to day one, uh, panel one. Uh, this is on reflections of the Amici or the friends of the court uh, who, you know, made submissions in the Ongwen uh, appeals uh, proceedings. Uh, we're going to talk about the legal issues, of course, and sexual and gender-based crimes. Uh, I am Priyadarshini Narayanan. I work at the International Criminal Court, Office of the Prosecutor. I am an appeals counsel, but I must stress that I'm here purely in my personal capacity. Now, as everyone knows, the Ongwen Appeals Judgment was quite a significant landmark in the court's work. Um, and it is, I think, an important uh, moment to pause, reflect, uh, think about what it means to us all, but especially for victims and survivors. Um, and so my very special thanks to the organizers for making this happen. Uh, this is really an important conversation. The opening conversation, which we just heard, I think was a very powerful reminder of why we're here, why we do the work we do. Uh, so thank you very much. Personally, I found it very moving. So this morning's panel will address slightly different issues. Um, it's really on the legal lens uh, on sexual and gender-based crimes. Uh, but fortunately, we have several experts over here who uh, also participated as amici in the proceedings. And uh, so following the pattern of self-introduction, I will ask them to please uh, do that, maybe starting with uh, Yoke. Would you like? Hi. Can everyone hear me? Hi, everyone. My name is Ede Joke Badminton uh, but I go by Joke for short. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me. I'm one of the, the group that submitted to the court on duress and the standards to assess evidence of sexual and gender-based violence. I'm a former investigator, I used to work at the ICC. Uh, in addition, I provide capacity building training to national prosecutors, investigators, and other stakeholders on prosecuting these atrocity crimes within their own jurisdiction, um, among other things that I do. So great to be here. I turned that off. <laughs> Thank you also uh, to everyone for being here. My name is Jocelyn Getchen Kestenbaum. I direct the Human Rights and Atrocity Prevention Clinic here at Cardozo Law. And I was part of a group of 14 uh, experts, uh, both scholars and practitioners in the am amicus brief that was addressing sexual slavery, enslavement, and cumulative convictions. And it was a broad uh, area of law. So I'm going to try to cover everything that we put into those short, I think, 15 pages. Uh, but just know that uh, I'm here for any discussions further also about the, the subject matter uh, beyond this panel, but I'm really excited to be here and be with everyone else who we were collaborating with in those intense days back in December 2021. Hello, everyone. My name is Valerie Osterveld. I'm a professor at Western University's Faculty of Law in Canada and um, as has been said, I'm so excited to be here because we did all of our process mostly on Zoom, and there are many people that I had never met in person until today, so this is wonderful. I worked with a wonderful group of women, both practitioners and academics, on the topic of forced marriage. Thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alix Vilma. I am with the NGO Women's Initiatives for Gender Justice. And together with uh, the Global Justice Center, Amnesty International, and the very renowned uh, Dr. Rosemary Gray, we submitted an amicus brief on forced pregnancy. And I'll be very happy to share some of the main findings of with you today. Thank you. 
Well, thank you very much, everyone. Um, so just in terms of the format for this panel, we'll uh, follow a question and answer format. Um, and just to be able to keep it as dynamic as possible and, uh, you know, to see how the, how the, where the conversation takes us. Um, but then, of course, we'd like to hear from the audience afterwards. Uh, so I would, I think, um, ask maybe everyone to try to keep their contributions to under five minutes if possible. But uh, just to set the stage for what follows, um, I think everybody knows, of course, that the Appeals Chamber confirmed the convictions for Dominic Ongwen for all 19 counts of uh, sexual and gender-based crimes, among other uh, crimes as well. Uh, but within that, there were crimes that, uh, that he directly committed, um, so against women and girls within his own household. Um, and that includes, of course, forced marriage is another inhumane act, forced pregnancy, torture, rape, sexual slavery, enslavement, etc. Uh, but there are also the systemic crimes, uh, which were committed uh, as a result of a broader policy, the LRA policy, and there were convictions entered for those crimes as well. Now, the judgment, the Yongwen Appeals Judgment, and the Yongwen case, in fact, uh, stands for many firsts at the International Criminal Court. Um, as many of you know, the courts does have quite a legal, uh, sort of, uh, sorry, a robust legal framework for sexual and gender-based crimes, and many crimes have been included in the statute for the first time. Um, and of course, sexual and gender-based crimes are among the gravest of crimes under the statute. Uh, but even within that category, there are several differences in terms of how one looks at the underlying harm, the underlying protected interest, for example. So as many of you know, there are sexual crimes which may not include um, physical violence. There are gender-based crimes which may not include sexual violence. And there are many crimes that include sexual and gender-based harm. Um, and many, of course, in, in this case as well. Um, I think, as was also mentioned in the opening conversation, of course, we're all very aware that the legal lens, it is a narrow one. And certainly the legal solution is not the only solution, but it is an important solution. And this is where um, the Ongwen Appeals Judgment comes in, um, as well as I think the strategy as well in the Ongwen case, because it is to explore as broadly as possible, based on the evidence, of course, the toolkit that the ICC statute provides. Um, so that is a first. Uh, it's, of course, also a first because it's the first case at the ICC where convictions specifically on forced marriage as another inhumane act and forced pregnancy were entered. But among other things, and for me, what is also really significant about the Ongwin Appeals Judgment is the approach that the chambers have taken to sexual and gender-based crimes. Uh, so firstly, um, I think it's also that this approach will be relevant, not just to the Ongwin case, not just to cases within the situation of Uganda, but more broadly to the court's work as well. What the court did is to look um, at the, of course, the letter of the law as it appears in our statute, but to also link it to the underlying harm and the protected values uh, of each crime. So, for example, the underlying value of the crime of forced pregnancy is reproductive autonomy. The underlying value of forced marriage as another inhumane act is, of course, it's a violation of the right to marry freely um, and without coercion. And likewise, for slavery crimes, it is protection against servitude. Uh, what's, what's important, again, to note is that all these underlying harms or protected interests, they're not fungible. Uh, they, they, they're all quite distinct in many ways, and they need to be recognized as such. And this is also important from a broader point of view, because what it does is to link the text of the statute what happens in the courtroom with the experiences or the harm suffered by those who actually matter at the end of the day. Uh, so th this is, I think, one takeaway from the appeals judgment. Another one is that when it comes particularly to sexual and gender-based crimes, given their very nature as well and the difficulties that victims and survivors um, face in testifying on these matters and witnesses as well, 
the court uh, proposed that we take a nuanced and a careful approach to looking at the evidence. And this is, again, very important from a litigation point of view uh, and has, you know, cross case relevance as well. And similar approaches have been taken in other cases as well before the ICC beyond Ongo. Uh, and I'm sure the panelists will take these issues forward. But uh, before I hand it over, uh, just very briefly on the process, the appellate process before the ICC, because it can, it's quite particular. Uh, the first thing is, of course, there are three, broadly three different phases in every case uh, before the ICC. There's a pretrial phase uh, before the pretrial chamber where essentially the, the prosecution or the prosecutor brings charges and the chamber decides uh, whether to confirm those charges or not based on the evidence. Then you have the trial phase before the trial chamber where this is actually, this relates to the actual um, hearing of the evidence of the testimony from the witnesses. And this led by the prosecution, the defense and the victims as well. And based on that, the, the trial ch uh, chamber will render a trial judgment, which essentially is the main factual record of the case with the factual findings. Now, the appellate process is relatively limited compared to the trial process. It is not a retrial. Uh, the purpose of an appellate process is uh, purely so that so the appeals judges, based on what the parties submit, uh, they can determine, or rather they can be satisfied that there is no error uh, with the trial chamber findings. So um, so that's, I think, an important distinction in, in, this, in the conversation. Uh, so as well, just to explain, so when the appeals chamber calls for expertise on these issues, this is based on the factual record of the case, and the submissions don't amount to evidence. They, they are legal uh, submissions. Uh, and the parameters or the scope of an appeal are determined by essentially what a party will allege and based on submissions. So over here, the defense appealed the trial judgment, the prosecution responded, as did the victims. Uh, and then following that, the appeals chamber called for expertise on, for example, SGBC, but also on other issues as well. Um, so with that, um, I'm very happy to turn to the first question. Um, so I'd like to start with uh, Jyoki, if you don't mind, um, and then maybe Alex, and then Valerie and Jocelyn. So the first question is essentially, if you could please tell us what the essence of your submission is, and uh, very briefly, how the appeals chamber decided it. Thank you. Uh, so, as I mentioned earlier, in essence, our submission addressed the defense of duress that's contained in Article 31 1D of the Rome Statute and the standards applicable to assessing evidence of sexual and gender-based crimes. Um, before I go into this, I would really encourage those who have not yet had the chance to read the um, our submissions, about 15 pages, uh, to please do so because there's no way I can do justice in this short period of time to the excellent work done by, you know, the amazing women who were involved in this uh, submission. And if you don't have time to read 15 uh, pages, there's also an excellent opinion Uris piece done by one of our members, Dania. So please check that out. That should be like a five minute read. So Regarding duress, with respect to the defense of, defense of ju duress, um, there were two key points that we addressed. And in essence, Ongwen was required to show by pleading this defense, he was required to show that his conduct, and we need to remember what the conduct was, it was crimes of rape, forced marriage, and other sexual and gender-based crimes, that his conduct was caused by duress that resulted from, and there are certain elements that he must that must be demonstrated. And so the first is that there was a threat of imminent death or continuing or imminent serious bodily harm against himself or another person, and that he acted necessarily and reasonably to avoid this threat, and that he did not intend to cause a greater harm than the one that he sought to avoid. And so the trial chamber found that the defense was not available to him, especially because there was no evidence of this threat of imminent death or continuing imminent serious bodily harm against himself or someone else resulting in what he um, in the crimes that he committed. And I really appreciate Sarah's insights that she shared earlier today on whether the legal system is well equipped to address issues of duress and capacity 
given that you know these legal assessments are of defenses are often not rooted in the social and cultural realities and in a way that's sort of what we tried to address when we um focused on the importance of taking a gender lens to these defenses because oftentimes people talk about taking a gender lens to um assessing evidence of course assessing the crimes but also the defenses that are raised and this was especially important given that this was the very first time that the court was dealing with a defense of duress and also dealing with it coming from a victim perpetrator. And so what we then did was to, to, to present to the court why it was important um, to take a gender lens to this situation because it would require the court to acknowledge, um, take into account um, Ongren's own role in perpetuating, uh, creating a culture that allowed SGBC to occur. Um, also, it will take into account his own role in, well, first of all, his, his gender and his role in um, upholding a patriarchal society uh, that allowed these crimes to, um, to be committed. And so connected to that, we presented to the court that it was important for the court to read into the Rome Statute, um, into Article 31, the principle, the doctrine of prior fault, which would cause the court to look into the conduct of the accused himself. And this was important because the doctrine of prior fault is not expressly mentioned in the Rome Statute. Um, however, we were able to draw from comparative criminal law, also drawing from um, uh, a dissenting opinion by Judge Cassese at the ICTY, and then also joined from the ECCC. And so we were essentially pointing out to the court that by being attentive to these issues, the court would be required to see whether duress indeed is the kind of um, defense that could be brought against um, with respect to crimes of sexual and gender-based violence. So that's just very briefly with respect to duress. Um, on the standards for evaluating evidence of sexual and gender-based violence, just some key points. The first key point that we mentioned to the court may seem really obvious, uh, but trust me, it's not. The fact that the court asked for submissions on this point shows that it isn't. And the first key point that we mentioned was just that the same evidentiary standards apply to evidence of sexual violence as to evidence of other crimes. So there are no higher standards that should be applied. Um, you have to look at the same issues of reliability, credibility of the evidence, probative value. And the reason why, even though it seems obvious, but it's important to stress that is because they're often prejudicial assumptions, um, you know, that that go into evaluation of sexual and gender-based violence. And so we thought it was important to note those prejudicial assumptions and call the call, remind the court, I guess, of um, the obligation to ensure that there's no adverse distinction um, and no adverse effects. And of course, taking into account um, the human rights principles of ensuring uh, no discriminatory presumptions um, in its assessment um, of the evidence. So I would leave it there, but those are some key points, but please read the, mm -hmm. <laughs> read the submission if you haven't had a chance to. There's a lot more details in there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and first of all, Priya, thank you very much for your for your context and introduction to this. And um, let me very much acknowledge also Victoria and your organization. And thank you for um, giving me at least the context that I need to learn uh, what the impact is of our work. And then I'm going to steal Joker's um, first introduction by saying that please do go to, to the Amici briefs um, and read them there for uh, the full extent of uh, the essence of our um, comments. Um, before I dive into the essence of our brief, let me just point out as well that um, other Amici briefs touched on the issue of forced pregnancy, including uh, the, the one by Professor Myersfeld in the South African Litigation Center, as well as the Amicus brief of Mariana Ardia and other colleagues uh, who touched pretty much on, on same issues. Um, the essence of our brief was essentially threefold. Uh, we discuss the legal interest behind the crime of forced pregnancy, offering that it is indeed um, reproductive autonomy, as you pointed out, Priya. Uh, we touched upon the elements of the crime and deconstructing the meaning of the words or lack of the words uh, used in the Rome Statute definition of forced pregnancy, uh, including and focused really on the terms unlawful confinement. What does that mean? And the condition of specific intent. 
uh, and we gave a commentary on the sentence that is included in the definition that uh, national abortion laws are irrelevant. So let me dive into that a little bit more. On the first point, the legal interest uh, behind the crime, uh, that is reproductive autonomy. We explained that the criminalization of forced pregnancy protects the right of every person to exercise agency over their sexuality, over their fertility, ultimately over their body. Um, and with that, the legal interest um, behind the crime is to protect personal, sexual, and reproductive autonomy. Um, and indeed, this autonomy was the rationale very much for the inclusion of the crime in the Rome Statute, separate from the crime of rape and separate from the crime of unlawful confinement. Or in other words, what we offered is or explained is that forced pregnancy involves quite a bit more than making a person forcibly pregnant, and it involves more than keeping a person confined. What it is about is taking away the person's decision-making capacity over whether or not and under what circumstances to proceed with the pregnancy. Classifying these acts as deprivation of reproductive autonomy also serves the very important purpose of indicating that the harm lies in taking away somebody's uh, choice over that pregnancy. That is the harm. So the harm is not the impregnation, it's not the possible abortion, it's not providing or not contraception, it's not all of these other acts, if you will. The harm is taking away a person's choice. So while the crime protects the right to choose how to carry out the pregnancy, including on having an abortion or not, it also includes accessing healthcare services, and it includes accessing information which may facilitate the decision making on the pregnancy. Um, a point that we touched upon as well, and it's not strictly legal, um, but is whether this is too political to address in this legal context, as it is something that the defense had raised in their uh, submissions. And it is something that when you look at the broader context of this space that we occupy and the discussions ongoing also in this country, um, it is a very important one. So is it too political to fully discuss upholding reproductive rights, uh, including information on and access to abortion? No. Uh, the answer there that we offered is quite clear because international and regional instruments explicitly protect these rights. And the majority of countries including the majority of countries um, party to the Rome Statute, the founding treaty of the ICC, allow access to abortion, particularly in the context of rape. So let me leave it at that for uh, the first element uh, that we, um, or the, the first essence, if you will, of our submission, and quickly move to the, to the other two, if I still have a few minutes, thank you. Uh, on the elements of crime, uh, we offered our view on unlawful confinement and the condition of specific um, intent. But let me focus here uh, to save a bit of time on unlawful confinement. Um, the Rome Statute, uh, the, the context in which we operate here, does not define the term of unlawful confinement. Um, but as most of you will know, the Rome Statute and its sort of practitioners need to take into account human rights standards. And when you take that human rights analysis, and please do refer to the uh, amicus brief um, for this analysis in full, um, together with very helpful ICTY jurisprudence, confinement can not be interpreted very narrowly, which I mean to be the, the bodily internment, if you will, under lock and key, but it must be understood quite more broadly that confinement is also present when you can leave the place where you are bodily confined, if you will, but you have nowhere place to go. Um, you, you can leave, but you have no place to hide. And that is also part of being confined, which is also very interesting to take into account in broader discussions outside of this field. Um, and then let me touch upon the third essence of our submission, which is a commentary on the sentence in the Rome Statute definition that um, the relevance of national abortion law. Uh, let me read it out. The definition of forced pregnancy includes 
um, this shall not in any way be interpreted as affecting national laws related to pregnancy. Um, but this sentence is merely stating the obvious. The ICC has no authority, nor does it want to have, um, any authority to directly amend, nullify, or void national legislation. It is not the purpose of this sentence to add a new element of the crime whatsoever, nor is it intended or does it restrict the ICC's interpretation. Its purpose, its sole purpose, was to confirm that forced pregnancy in the Rome Statute does not in itself invalidate national abortion restrictions. And to your uh, question, Priya, how the appeals chamber engaged on all of our um, comments and submissions, it took everything on board. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a real privilege to be here with all of you. And I want to note that, as the others have, that I'm not here uh, speaking on my own behalf. I'm part of a group. And that wonderful team was composed of Aaron Baines, Anne-Marie de Brouwer, Annie Bunting, Ify de Volder, Kathleen Maloney, Melanie O'Brien, Osai Ojigo, and Indira Rosenthal. And together, we created this brief on forced marriage. They brought this team brought to the table academic points of view, practitioner points of view, and it was the melding of that that is the result of our brief that I'm going to talk to you about today. But I'm going to first tell you what the defense was arguing because the, the way the defense was arguing about forced marriage structured the way that we responded in our amicus brief. So Mr. Ongwen's defense raised four main points on forced marriage. First of all, they argued that forced marriage is not a crime under the International Criminal Courts Rome Statute. And therefore, when Mr. Anguen was convicted at trial of forced marriage, that he was convicted of a new crime, which violated the principle of legality, under which a person cannot be convicted of an act that was not a crime at the time of the commission of that act. The second argument made by the defense was that forced marriage did not satisfy the elements of the crime against humanity of other inhumane acts, which is the category in which this crime was charged. The third argument made by the defense was that if there is a crime of forced marriage, it was not Mr. Ongwen that committed it, it was Joseph Coney, and that the purported husbands, including Mr. Ongwen, held the girls and women in trust for Mr. Coney, and then it was Mr. Coney who determined the fate of forced marriage at his pleasure. And the last argument that was made by the defense was that the facts did not support charges of forced marriage. And one of the arguments that we did not address in our brief because it arose right on the floor on the day that we were presenting our amicus brief by the defense was that there was no marriage, so the defense argued there was no marriage between the perpetrators and the victims because one of the requirements of marriage in the Acholi culture was parental consent, and there was not parental consent, and therefore there could not have been marriage, and therefore there was only mere cohabitation. But that was an argument that was addressed by the judges because it was uh, amongst those that were um, raised throughout the process. So given these defense arguments, our team made three main points in reply and at the hearing. First of all, to the point that forced marriage is not a uh, crime listed in the Rome Statute, we argued that forced marriage was properly charged and properly considered by the trial chamber as a crime against humanity of other inhumane acts. And it doesn't matter that forced marriage is not listed explicitly in the Rome Statute because it can indeed be charged and prosecuted and has been recognized as an other inhumane act and falling within that category for at least 14 years. Now 15 years, because we argued this a year ago. It was recognized by the Special Court for Sierra Leone, the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia, and in other contexts, and not at that level, but by the International Criminal Court and addressing a time span of over 40 years, if you take all of these courts' um, rulings on this together. So not only 
had forced marriage been considered to be an inhumane act for quite some time in international criminal law, covering the same time period as Mr. Ongwen's acts, the category of other inhumane acts has been expressly recognized and prohibited in international law for more than 75 years and recogni recognized not only as being listed in many different documents, starting with the statutes for the Nuremberg and Tokyo trials, but all the way through to the International Law Commission's draft treaty on the prevention and punishment of crimes against humanity of 2019. So we have this category that is widely recognized in international criminal law, statutorily and under customary international law. So given this long-standing recognition in law of forced marriage as an illegal inhumane act and of the category in which it falls, it did not violate, in our view, the principle of legality. And the appeals chamber agreed on these points. The second main argument that we raised was that forced marriage is a harm that's distinct from the other types of crimes against humanity listed in the Rome Statute because it has two main aspects to it. First of all, the violation by the accused of the victim's relational autonomy, and I'll explain uh, what we mean by this in a moment, and a constellation of human rights violations. So what we meant by saying that forced marriage is a violation of relational autonomy is that those who are subjected to forced marriage do not have the ability to consent to whom their conjugal partner is and is going to be. So it's, it's a lot like forced pregnancy, as Alix described a moment ago. They can't choose with whom to have their conjugal relationship because it's imposed upon them. And this violates international human rights law and also violates international criminal law. International criminal law. And we agreed with the trial chamber's approach to this, which correctly described this deprivation of relational autonomy as the imposition, regardless of the will of the victim, of a forced conjugal union in which the victim is exclusively attached to the other member of the union, resulting in consequent social stigma. And the appeals chamber also agreed with the trial chamber. Now, citing our submissions, which was very exciting, I must say, the appeals chamber indicated that it doesn't matter whether this forced conjugal relationship is considered to be legal marriage under domestic law or not. The appeals chamber found that forced marriage may be established on the facts of the case, including the nature of the relationship between the perpetrator and the victim, as well as, and this is very important, the subjective view of the victim, third parties, and the perpetrator committing the act, and that person's intention to consider the two of them as spouses. We also put forward the fact that forced marriage doesn't only happen in armed conflict. It can happen under oppressive regimes. It can happen without a war during times of mass atrocity. And it can occur regardless of the victim's previous marriage status. Now, the second type of harm that falls within the, uh, this distinctive category of forced marriage is a constellation of human rights violations. And we argue that this constellation, this gathering of human rights violations differs from place to place, from forced marriage situation to forced marriage situation. And it can include a whole number of human rights violations. And I'll just give you a sense of a few that we had listed abduction, rape, sexual slavery, non-consent to being coerced into a polygamous conjugal situation, forced pregnancy, forced childbearing and child rearing, physical violence, restrictions on freedom of movement, psychological violence, psychological and physical effects on children born of forced marriage and the constant threat of death. And the appeals chamber agreed that all of these are grave acts. And therefore, the appeals chamber found that forced marriage differs from other enumer enumerated acts listed as crimes against humanity in a couple of different ways. 
Now they didn't adopt the same language that we put forward, but they got there in the end. Uh, first of all, the forced ascription of the status of spouse is not reflected in the other enumerated acts. And secondly, certain of the constellation of rights violations can overlap with other enumerated acts, but they also don't need to overlap. And therefore, that forced marriage is a distinct inhumane act. The third main argument we made was that forced marriage is a continuing crime carried out over time and in multiple locations. And again, here, the appeals chamber agreed. Forced marriage does not consist only of the moment in which the forced marriage relationship is declared or becomes a reality factually. It endures during the entire period of the relationship. It's about the conjugal association. It's in its entirety over space and time. And lastly, we argued that sentencing decisions on forced marriage needed to take into account the age-related vulnerability of young victims and the gender discriminatory nature of the crimes as aggravating factors because forced marriage occurs at intersections of identities and the appeals chamber agreed that the trial chamber correctly took these intersections into account. And I just want to end here by saying, while we had all of these arguments taken up by the appeals chamber, of course, we did not do this alone. There was another brief by um, Professor Meyersfeld in the South Africa um, Litigation Center that made similar arguments, but also the Office of the Prosecutor and the common legal representatives of the victims helped to flesh all of these out, to, to make these arguments. And it was together, all of these arguments ended up being adopted by the appeals chamber. Yes, one, please. Maybe we should have ended with yours, Valerie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm realizing as you're talking that we went up against the trial chamber, not up against the defense. So I think that will explain a lot of uh, the reason why what I'm going to tell you did not really get taken up by the appeals court. But I still think it's really important work. It is essential because, as Sarah said in the first hour, there are limits to law but some of the limits are our own blinders. Sometimes the law actually does protect against harm and we aren't seeing that harm and we aren't correctly characterizing that harm. And I think that's the essence of the brief that I, along with 14, 13 other feminist uh, scholars and practitioners, and I'll name them because they're rock stars and some of them are in this room and some of them actually know parts of this brief in terms of the underlying legal uh, you know, particulars or, or case law than I do. So um, Magali Maestre, Lily Cather, Sarita Ashraf, Stephanie Barbour, Kirsten Campbell, Maxine Marcus, Garana Milanarevic, I never say her last name correctly, I'm sorry, Garana, Valerie Usterveld, right next to me, Kathleen Roberts, Susanna Sahuto, who uh, is here and came at 5 a.m. on a train to make it here today, uh, Jelia Sane, uh, Hayuna Yang, and Indira Rosenthal. All of us came together to think about the issue of sexual slavery, enslavement as a crime against humanity, and then how that relates to cumulative convictions. And our submission, the bottom line of our submission is that sexual slavery is not a form of slavery or enslavement, but rather all acts of a sex sexual nature, all sexualized violence are evidence or indicia of the exercise of powers that attach to the rights of ownership over a person. So in other words, sexual slavery is slavery. And the court said, the trial chamber said that enslavement as a crime against humanity is in the abstract entirely encompassed within sexual slavery. 
And if you understood what I just said, that is really an untenable result from a practical, factual understanding of enslavement, because really it's the other way around. Enslavement is the crime and sexualized violence within the course of enslavement can be evidence of that enslavement. And so the idea is that with sexual slavery as the main crime within cumulative convictions, right? You have sexual slavery, you have enslavement, and the experts need to correct me if I get this wrong, but you have these two crimes one of which does not have elements that are completely distinct from the other, right? So you have enslavement, that is the exercise of powers of ownership over a, a person, and then sexual slavery, which is that exercise of powers of ownership, and then the cause to engage in an act of a sexual nature. So from a legal standpoint, the sexual slavery is the more specific crime, and therefore, in a cumulative conviction situation, sexual slavery would stand while enslavement would fall out. But from a standpoint of thinking about victims and survivors and the harms and the complete expressive nature of the harms that they experienced, it doesn't make sense. Enslavement is the crime that should stand because that accounts for sexualized violence and all other kinds of violence that persons enslaved experience over the course of their enslavement. So it's really uh, the, the court, we, we found that the court got it backwards when they decided to keep sexual slavery and drop enslavement from a cumulative conviction standpoint. Not disagreeing with the idea that you cannot convict for two crimes when there is not an element that is distinct uh, with both crimes, each having a distinct element. So the other aspect of the brief that I think is really important to understand, and again, <laughs> there was so much content that went into the, the 15 pages of that brief. So when you read it, also think about how much we didn't get to put in that brief. But what the other really important aspect of this is is that when you do bifurcate slavery crimes the way in which the Rome Statute does, you have a discriminatory application of the law. And that's a violation of Article 21.3, which the court didn't really take up. And I'm not sure what will be for the future, but I think it was received. I just think that it's hard to understand uh, from the, the appellate perspective, the limitations, I think, of the appellate uh, process. But the discriminatory application of the law that we found was that when you have the, the impact of bifurcating enslavement and sexual slavery, you have certain victims. And as Valerie was stating, specifically victims that are, are at the intersection of several identities. And we gave examples of child victims, both girl, child, boy, child, all genders of children, that they did not receive a full accounting of the harms. And I'll give one example. So the Angwen trial chamber failed to recognize that sexualized ownership exercised over children of all genders whether or not they were caused to engage in an act of a sexual nature, like the girl child ting tings, for example, their enslavement, their experience of enslavement, whose sexuality and reproduction were completely controlled and controlled through grooming, through menstrual checks, through excluding them from being able to engage in acts of a sexual nature if they so chose to do so. All of those harms were not fully acknowledged by the court and through these particular uh, crimes as they were applied. And then the other thing that this brief tried to touch upon is the way in which enslavement and the acts that could be evidence of enslavement could also be crimes. And that was never really understood or characterized by the court. So for example, 
forced marriage acts, sexualized torture, forced pregnancy, other acts that do not include heteronormative male on female rape, for example, were excluded from the legal interpretation of enslavement. And these are all indicia or evidence of enslavement, ways in which people have their uh, owner, are, are exercising ownership over a person when those people are enslaved. So the finding that sexual slavery fully encompasses enslavement, that led to a discriminatory application of the law, especially with regard to gender and age and along these intersectional lines of identity when those acts of a, a sexual nature did not include heteronormative rape and heteronormative male on female rape specifically in the course of enslavement. You have enslaved boy child soldiers who were not actually even characterized as enslaved, but we would consider to be enslaved children who were forced to rape, for example. You have enslaved girl child ting tings who experienced forced menstrual checks, as I said, forced virginity, you have enslaved uh, Ting Tings who became so-called wives who were controlled sexually throughout their enslavement. And that's whether or not they were actually raped. And the children completely left out of victimization and survivorship. And then therefore all of this discussion about reparations, the children who were born in captivity were also enslaved. Those were enslaved children and they were owned in their entire selves, including their sexual autonomy, reproductive autonomy, et cetera. So that was what our brief was trying to emphasize, trying to emphasize that we do recognize that there are limitations in the way that we historically and then into the present understand the crime of enslavement and how we've understood the sexualized violence that happens in the course of enslavement. And while it's in, extremely important and really necessary that there was a movement to visibilize sexualized violence in the course of enslavement, we, we can't discount how important that was in the course of the evolution of international justice, but that now that we are evolving even further, we can understand how the way that we bifurcated these crimes actually does lead to discriminatory application of the law. So I'll leave it there and I'm sure there'll be questions and I'm happy to, to take questions. Thanks very much. That was, that was really good. And I think all of you, you brought out the essence of your submissions as well as what the chamber decided, but also what the broader contributions are to SGBT jurisprudence. So that's, that's very helpful. So I think that takes me to maybe the next question, which is really to ask you about what you think are the uh, sort of is the broader impact of this decision. Of course, we're talking about the law and legal issues, but what do you see as sort of going beyond, say, the courtroom, going beyond litigation, uh, keeping this judgment in mind? And, uh, you know, just for some variety, I'm going to change the order again, if that's all right. So could I start, please, with you, Valerie, and then maybe Alex, uh, Jocelyn, and then uh, Jyoti, please. Thank you. Thank you. So I think that the broader impact of this judgment is, firstly, kind of at the, the most narrow level, that it has set some precedent or some guidance for other cases that also are dealing with facts, factual scenarios that involve forced marriage. And I'm thinking particularly at the International Criminal Court of the Al-Hassan case in, in Mali, but obviously would apply to other cases as well. And thinking about um, some of the issues under preliminary examination, for example. This case also reiterated, and I think very importantly, the intersectional considerations of vulnerability, the intersections of vulnerability of victims. And in this case, it was due to age and to gender, but in other situations, it could be other forms of intersection. What I thought was really important as well was that the court indicated some deeper thinking and not just the court but all of us who were involved in in the processes deeper thinking 
within international criminal, criminal law force marriage more generally. And I say this because as someone who's been tracking this particular harm over the years, there's been some uh, lack of clarity within international courts and tribunals as to exactly what are the harms that are meant to be captured by this title, this, this category of forced marriage. And this brought some clarity to that because of all of the thinking that was going on. And lastly, I think there is some thing that some things that we need to take away from this process in thinking about what should be in the draft Crimes Against Humanity Convention. And forced marriage, for example, could be one of those acts that is explicitly inserted into the convention as it become, moves from the discussion stage to hopefully the drafting stage. But not only forced marriage, we should be thinking it broader. What else has not been explicitly named that should be named in that treaty. Thank you. And thank you very much, Valerie. Um, many of the points that you raised are very true with respect to the impact, the broader impact that um, the uh, decision on forced pregnancy will and may have. Um, our opening discussion uh, asked the question, what is the common good, as, as Patty um, worded it? And that should be really the, the, the leading um, the leading question that should guide us in this. Um, Victoria, thank you again for your input on also that question. And as you very well put it, this is a tool. Um, and that is also very much how I, from my perspective of my work, approach it as an advocacy tool to bring these discussions forward. So um, to complement on what Valerie has just said, um, it, it, it is solidified now into ICC applet jurisprudence that forced pregnancy holds these components. Um, so it does set standards for other chambers. Um, these standards can also be used by um, other accountability initiatives, be it regional, be it national. It can be used by uh, NGO colleagues who seek to uh, advance the understanding of this particular crime to unearth what has happened. Uh, therefore, it can also inform the recognition of other crimes, on other gender-based crimes, other forms of sexual violence, because as I think you mentioned, uh, and other panelists as well, it forces us to, to think about uh, what are the acts that are before us and how do we categorize them. Um, a few other things perhaps that I can touch upon is that as some of you might know, the ICC's um, structure is that it has a trust fund for victims. It has a reparation scheme that is directly tied to the decision-making process in the main cases, if you will. So now that that is uh, final, uh, the reparations scheme of the ICC can really uh, proceed, uh, to which extent that can have a real impact on the affected communities uh, is a matter of a, a separate discussion. Um, one other point that is very important, I feel, to note is that this uh, judgment on uh, forced pregnancy is yet another bridge, a very clear one, between the international criminal law field and the human rights field, and to an extent the, the international humanitarian uh, law field as well. They are still quite separate, uh, unfortunately, but this is yet another bridge there as well. Maybe a question to you, Priya. Will this encourage investigators, prosecutors to charge more often, to know that judges' chambers might now recognize um, these charges in more, in a better way, and then linked as well, my last, no, uh, I have another point. Uh, my second to last point is the indeed the crime, uh, the draft Crimes Against Humanity uh, Convention. Um, in the current draft, uh, there's a copy paste of that little sentence that I mentioned before, um, and it might be this decision, a stronger tool for all of us who feel that this is important on how to interpret this crime, uh, not to interpret it in a narrow context, and especially on that little sentence on the irrelevance of uh, national law related to pregnancy. Um, and then the very last point that I would like to make, I have more, but the last point that I would like to make on this is that, um, as, as Patty said this morning, 
um, it is very much, I felt as well, a sort of revival of this huge feminist movement, getting us all together, um, be atten attentive to the historical opportunities that was be were before us, and really taking it. So I'm answering your call uh, and challenge as well, Patty, uh, to be on the lookout because the impact that this way of working all of us together uh, is something that we should maintain. Thank you. Yeah, so I'll just add to what my colleagues have already said that I had listed here as well. I really feel like for all of you in the audience who are studying international law, this particular judgment shows how critical it really is to understand and be able to navigate between and among the various areas of international law as we encourage everyone to become more professionalized and more specific in their practice, we have to not forget how each of these areas of law can really influence one another. So I would say at the time of the drafting of the Rome Statute, there was a lot of influence by activists that were human rights activists on those documents. And, at, and international criminal law then had a lot of uh, progressive um, forward-looking, you know, aspects to it that then influenced international human rights law and specifically thinking about intersectionality, thinking about gender and the definition and the limits to the definition that, uh, that we had under the uh, Rome statute or we still have under the Rome statute. Uh, so just understanding how all of these different areas of law intersect and really how important we need, it is to even interpret the Rome statute with non-discrimination as one of the key pillars and really recognizing how we can still be, even in the perfect application of the letter of the law, potentially engaging in discriminatory application uh, as it relates to harms. And I do think that it should maybe hopefully influence the office of the prosecutor there are other policy potentials out there, like policies on uh, slavery crimes. And hopefully with this decision, it will become clear that more guidance and more policy needs to be developed in, in that area. And with the dra Draft Crimes Against Humanity Treaty, I can't agree with everyone who has already spoken more. We have a real opportunity with this draft treaty to influence at the national level where enforcement is critical and, and most um, you know, concrete to really further and advance our thinking in international human rights law and national criminal law of an international criminal nature through that treaty. So I think it's critical and, it, and it's so important that we think about how this decision can really move forward that agenda at the, that's currently before the United Nations. I'll stop there and I'll let Joe Kay. Thank you. Um, so for our submission, the court, the chamber, the appeals chamber did not delve so deeply into um, our submission and the issues. So for instance, with duress, it upheld the find in the trial chamber and <laughs> I'm right there with you. <laughs> we we are right there with you. <laughs> so it upheld, which I mean, which was fine. And um, but when I think about the broader impact of the submission of the work that we did, I, I I'm you know I think it's huge. So first of all, the fact that we brought we had together very diverse like a diverse group, um, people with different specializations, expertise. So um, our group consisted of Luis Ar Arimatsu, Daniel Chaikel, Cynthia Tai, Angela Mudikuti, Kristen Chinkin, Carolyn Ed Ed Edgerton, and myself. Um, and then we were also supported by amazing women who collectively we had folks who had backgrounds in international human rights law, people who worked directly with stakeholders and survivor um, associations. And so bringing all those perspectives to then put forward submissions to the court on legal interpretations of duress, on the standards that are applicable, it, it, to me, it was, it was a really wonderful thing that has a broader impact. This is um, was mentioned earlier about how we work together on these issues. So then it's not, you know, 
just one group of people working or putting forward ideas, but really ensuring you have uh, a broader, a broader perspectives and, and more people at the table actually in putting forward the ideas. And also, this was the very first time, as I mentioned, it was the first time the court was dealing with the issue of duress. And so the fact that our submissions are on record, um, these submissions, our analysis, the, the stress and the point of ensuring a gender analysis of the defenses, um, that's something that's available to those who are doing these at other, whether in other um, international courts or even national systems. And that ties also to the standards. So the fact that, you know, we enumerated six key standards, but then also delved into the importance of taking a gender analysis to look at this to prevent um, a discriminatory interpretation of the rules of evidence. Um, and so that is also available then for those practitioners who are looking to, you know, um, bring cases using universal jurisdiction, for example, in national courts. So I, I think definitely there's a broad impact beyond what we did as a collective for the court. Um, and, and it's something that opens the door for a deeper analysis, I think, especially with respect to duress, because that's something that oftentimes, you know, had just been looked at as an academic issue. And so for the first time, we're dealing with it in, you know, in, in at the International Criminal Court, but then also saying that you have to have a gender um, lens when you're assessing this defense as well. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I think clearly there's a broader impact of this decision, and I think you've brought it out in so many different ways. Uh, I was just trying to keep a list of some of them, and you know it's already a couple of pages, so so that's really interesting. Uh, but I think my next and last question is really, I mean, going from the broader impact, looking outwards, uh, to take a moment to look inwards, right? So knowing what you know uh, right now. Um, what, if anything, would you do differently? Um, I mean, it, the question's quite broad. And so, I mean, it's really to sort of, so we all have a moment to think about it and, and assess where we are as well, uh, since I think that's largely also the theme of, of uh, the two days. Uh, so uh, maybe Jocelyn, could I start with you on this one? And then maybe Valerie, Joke, and then... Uh, last but definitely not the least, Alex. Sure. So, oh, what would we do differently? So, uh, you know, it, it was a whirlwind. And I think part of international law practice, law practice more generally, but especially in the international legal field, there is this sense of deadline and, you know, we have to move quickly. And so there were a lot of constraints in terms of the amount of time that we had. Under those constraints, though, we still have to slow down and we still have to really make sure of who's at the table. And I think looking back, we, we tried to get as much input as we could from Ugandan survivors and survivor groups, but I think we fell short on that end. I think the time was so crunched and, and we were trying to get the legal arguments right. But I think in that we missed maybe some of the essence of the reasons behind what we were doing. And I think we needed more time for that. And, and we should have you know been able to get more input from survivors, even in the limited time that we had if, if you know we weren't so maybe focused on getting the exact legal argumentation in the exact way that we needed to, which is also important. But you know that's to say that these time constraints can really then take your process in a direction that you don't necessarily want if you are really truly wanting a feminist process. And that's what you know ultimately we need to be really reflexive about. And what does that mean? And how do we do it better? And how do we maybe push back? And, and can we in some ways push back when there are these tight deadlines for turning things around? Because there is, and this is the other thing I think I wish we had emphasized more, is you know at the end of our brief, we talk about the interests of justice. We talk about the fact that we recognize that the way the law 
is written down in the Rome statute made the court come to this decision. But in the interests of justice, it cannot be this way. And we tried to explain it as best we could. I think emphasizing that more, right? Really emphasizing Article 21.3, the court didn't use, I think, to the extent it should, the, the issues of Article 21.3 and non-discrimination. And, you know, there was this part that I, I quoted from the trial court in the abstract, right? In the abstract, well, <laughs> people and people's lives and the harms that they suffered are not abstract. And I think we should have just emphasized that more in our brief. I would have liked to have been stronger, I think, on that point. So I'll leave it with that. <laughs> Bad short-term memory. You get used to where you go in order. And <laughs> so I was just sitting there enthralled with what Jocelyn was saying because that was everything that I was going to say. So, but I did have uh, a couple of other things I wanted to add. What would I do differently? I would have thanked even more those who helped us be who we were. They're sitting at the back of the room, yes, Lily and absolutely. Um, <laughs> you guys should stand up right now, actually. <laughs> <laughs> they helped to create this inclusive, lovely feminist process. And because all of us tend to have to do this work on top of all of our other work, in addition to everything that we're already doing, they help to create the space in order to do that. Um, the only other thing I think I would say is that I do wish that we had more space in our, in our briefs. The, the appeals chamber doesn't want to read more, but we had so much more to say about the nuances of forced marriage, about the nuances of the harms and the experiences of forced marriage, which we couldn't say. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, so I'm going to echo <laughs> what Valerie and Jocelyn just shared, uh, the, the challenges of the time limits, page limits. Um, and so then what could we have done differently? And I guess the question is, even with the time limits and so on, is there anything that we could have done differently? And so of course, yes. Um, in terms of more inclusive, you know, a more inclusive approach in terms of having more people at the table. So for example, thinking of, you know, having more voices of those represented survivor groups to ensure that, especially on the section of the, you know, the negative presumptions that, that come out of adverse evidentiary standards that are, you know, that, that can have really negative implications. So to, to include some of that in there, um, would we have been able to do that with the, uh, with the page limits? Maybe not, maybe we could have still found a way to put it in there. So it's like the, uh, as Jocelyn mentioned, sometimes the challenges of the pressures cause you to think about things, you know, um, not as broadly as you, you could have. And so I guess even with the time limits, even with all of that, if we were to do this again, it's just thinking differently that no, we must ensure that we have more engagement at the table um, throughout the entire process. Um, I think also just in terms of, because we talk about you know the feminist approach and this excellence. So first of all, I have to say a big thank you to Patty who called us. I mean, she brought us all together. Um, Thank you. Um, and then lovingly took a step back and watched us you know, <laughs> do it. And so thank you so much. But like, and also like in the process, just thinking when we talk about having more engagement and so on, thinking about, you know, whose idea of feminism is it that we're putting forward, um, that there isn't just one. And so ensuring that when we talk about having more space, having engagement, but just being open to and allow other people's views on board. Um, this is not to say that we didn't do it or do to our best of ability, but as part of answering the question, you're just trying to think what are the different things to be aware of um, for future. That's definitely something. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll be quite brief because you have all three um, so very eloquently um, shared some of our own reflections as well. Um, we, we will do it again. 
we just need to indeed learn some lessons. Uh, I love the way that you phrase it. Uh, whose, whose idea of feminism are we putting forward? Whose idea of justice are we putting forward as well? Whose idea of gender, whose idea of what is a woman, et cetera, um, is, is something that we will take on into our next um, efforts, very much so indeed. Uh, and something that maybe is not too late to still do from my perspective as an advocate, if you were so advocating for, not necessarily working on the law itself, um, is to work more with our Ugandan colleagues to spread the word, to, but to understand and learn very much what the impact is of this decision, if if any, really, uh, and how we can support uh, one another. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I take that, I mean, I'm out of questions at this mm -hmm. point. Uh, well, officially, I do have others, but I think I'd like uh, maybe for the audience to um, you know, have some time to ask any questions that you might have or comments, etc. Thanks. Thank you all very much. I'm Emily Kenny. I'm a policy specialist at UN Women here in New York, working on rule of law and transitional justice. Um, so I have a question about forced pregnancy being charged as an other inhumane act. So maybe my question is for Valerie, maybe it's actually for Priya, although I know you're here in your personal capacity. So, um, so the Rome statute includes in article 71G, any other form of sexual violence of comparable gravity which to maybe a new person who's not familiar with the history of forced pregnancy, which you outlined for us, Valerie, that it has in the past been charged as an other inhumane act, my mind immediately thinks, why was it not charged as an other act of sexual violence of comparable gravity? Um, maybe it's the history of how it's been charged in the past, but maybe it's also that the crime is more than a crime of sexual violence. Although I think there are other crimes in that list in 71G, like forced pregnancy, that are also more than just an act of sexual violence, right? That crime is about reproductive autonomy. So maybe it, maybe that crime doesn't fit. And the reason why I'm asking this is thinking about the Crimes Against Humanity Convention and maybe thinking about advocating for forced pregnancy, forced marriage to be an enumerated, a listed crime in the convention. Should it be in that list of crimes of sexual violence or should it be somewhere else if it really is about something other than sexual violence? Thanks. Thank you, Emily. If I could draft the Crimes <laughs> Against Humanity Treaty, wow. <laughs> I would divide them up, not in the same way. So at the time that that list of forced pregnancy, sexual slavery, et cetera, was all grouped together, in the Rome Statute, we were ecstatic that there was even a longer list than at previous tribunals, but I would divide them up so that this, the clearly sexual crimes were together and then gender-based crimes could be in a separate category. Um, and you're right, the reason why it was charged, um, I believe, under other inhumane acts is because it's a gender-based crime. And I think this is captured well best by um, survivors of forced marriage that I had met in my work in Sierra Leone, where one of them said, you know, we live day to day and we do many things. And most of our day, we are doing childcare, finding food, making food, um, protecting the, the belongings of the person who was their so-called husband, et cetera. And then at, at night, yes, we were raped. But the majority of our time was doing the work of what the so-called husband in the Revolutionary United Front viewed as the work of women as wives. So to capture that accurately, it needs to be a gendered crime, a gender-based crime, and not only a sexual violence crime. And that's why I think it's better that it's not charged under that um, other forms of sexual violence of comparative, comparable gravity. Great. Thanks for that, Valerie. Uh, so if I could just, just take those two points. Um, 
Well, I think on forced marriage, um, I think certainly as Valerie said, uh, it's both, you know, sexual and, uh, uh, you know, gender-based harm. And this is also what came out uh, in the courtroom during the hearing. Um, and it's important because, for example, I think there were in, even within the particular fact pattern in the Ongwen case, there were some instances where um, victims were in a relationship of a, of a forced marriage, quote unquote, um, but there was no sexual violence. So there was essentially that gendered harm that bound them uh, to, to the perpetrator. And that was an important recognition as well, I, I believe uh, from the appeals chamber. Uh, on the question on forced pregnancy versus uh, you know, other forms of sexual violence, I think to some extent, uh, there's a conceptual answer and there's a technical answer. The conceptual answer is, uh, I think, as you flagged, um, the value is uh, really that of reproductive autonomy. So it goes beyond, it, it's a different kind of harm. It doesn't mean that a situation of forced pregnancy may not include uh, sexual harm, but I think uh, it's to more sort of very clearly outline or underscore the, the, the primary harm, if I could put it that way. Uh, but there's also a technical issue, which is, I think, just relating to the modalities of charging. So under our statute, forced pregnancy is, um, you know, it's an express crime in that sense, right? But other uh, forms of sexual violence is, I think, what falls in the residual category, which is a good thing in a way, because what it means is it excludes everything else, but it includes everything that isn't in the statute. So I think it's also to preserve that distinction when you charge, because you do need to be mindful of those um, technicalities when you do that. But I don't know if anybody else wanted to add to that. I mean, I'll just add that this isn't specific to forced marriage. I am not an expert on uh, that particular crime. But just to say that, in my view, all crimes are gendered. And we have to we have to understand that some of them are more visibly gendered, right? We can see the gendered nature of the crime because it's very visible when we start looking. But when we start looking at any other crime, even the commission of genocide, we start looking at the way in which the perpetration of the harms happen. They happen in a gendered way. And so while I do think we have to recognize that there are crimes that are more explicitly or visibly gendered, our gender-based analysis has to be throughout all crimes, all investigations, prosecutions uh, of international crimes because they are specifically perpetrated in a gendered way. And that is really with the intent to destroy community threads, to ensure that they are in, you know, shaming the victims and survivors. It really is a tactic, right, of the perpetration itself. And so I think we need to also take note that we don't want to limit ourselves too much when we are thinking about how we categorize crimes and also include our analyses as always being gendered and including that analysis. And harms are gendered as well. So not just the, um, the acts, but the, yeah. the outcomes are also very gendered. Yeah, exactly. I think, yeah, we'll see a hand. Point, uh, both, uh, Jocelyn and Valerie, uh, the, the categories are tricky um, and sexual violence is often thought of as a result of gender discrimination, right? Uh, it, whether against uh, women or girls, boys uh, or men. And so there is, a, as you say, a gendered element even in sexual violence. So to categorize sexual violence entirely separately from gender-based crimes is also tricky, um, you know, and, and I know Valerie, you and I and Indira have had conversations about sexual violence and other forms of gender-based violence being sort of the category, although it doesn't resolve the, you know, the, the how you would craft this differently. Uh, but I do think, I, I think that's an important point that gender uh, discrimination or, or, or gender, the gendered element is not something that's severable.
Thank you so much. <clears throat> I thought I would do injustice to myself and other survivors if I don't say this. When we heard of your submissions, we questioned how that really worked because first of all, to us, we believe you didn't understand the context and the reality on ground. But sitting here, listening to how you looked deeper legally into the real, real issues and then submitted, I must say, I'm blown away. I would like to thank you on my behalf and on behalf of all the other survivors. I know the job you did is a great one. And this still heads back to what I said earlier. Your experts in your own angle. Please, the only request we make, if you could match that expertise you have and the expertise the survivors have and just work together, I think we will do good. Thank you. Thank you very much and again for your presentation and for elaborating on the different briefs that you submitted. And uh, again, delving back into the process, which I'm very keen about, about the feminist collective. And I think it is Joke who asked uh, which feminists particularly. And again, sitting as a legal practitioner based in, the, in Uganda and the global South, and looking at how norms evolve and norms are entrenched, who is involved in the development of these norms. Uh, sexual violence is one of those where we've seen progress, significant progress at the international level. However, there's still remarkable drag at the domestic level. Um, and most it is because you see this remains at the international level. And perhaps my question, and uh, maybe it's a rhetorical one, is how do we see that all these developments at the global level take root at the national level? Do you think it would have been of added value to have Ugandan legal experts part of this process? Um, do you think it would have been useful to have nuanced legal analysis from the African legal system? Because I believe there's been considerable developments uh, growing from the interpretation of the provisions of the Maputo Protocol that would have enriched, especially in arguments on reproductive uh, autonomy, and how that would contribute to see that this remarkable, this remarkable progress on Section gender based crimes jurisprudence doesn't just remain at the global ICC level, but really influences norm development and protection at the domestic level. And thank you so much for your presentation. I am taken up by the gendered aspect of sexual violence. And this same question of whose feminist approach are we working with? Whose experience, you know? So I must say that for the aspect around sexual and gender-based violence, I see very beautiful discussion at the global level, similar experience with Sarah. If we look at how a domestic violence act for Uganda, and I implemented the trust fund for victim and the ICC. It took us four years to convince the ICC to put sexual and gender-based violence respond into the implementation strategy. The biggest focus was on physical rehabilitation of war victims and not the gendered aspect of how these war victims suffered violence and actually that they were also maimed. Um, not looking at the experience of war victim, how gendered they are, and not tackling uh, through gender transformative approaches in the implementation. So my question is, this beautiful conversation that we have at the global level, uh, because for me, uh, it's also the first time that we are learning from the ICC considering sexual violence 
uh, as crime against humanity? And to what extent are the implementation going to tackle the root causes of sexual and gender-based violence, even the repetitive aspect of it? We have war victims that has returned, and again, they were sexually abused in our hands, even when they had returned. So the biggest conversation is on the implementation, is on how to, how to ensure that at national level, uh, it becomes a policy issue. And also in terms of strategies for implementation, how are the budget allocated to deal with the, uh, the gendered aspect of sexual violence or the root causes because the budget does not see that it is completely blind. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for um, those reflections. Uh, I wanted to invite the panelists if they had any, uh, you know, further thoughts uh, based on on uh, on both both the the reflections so far. Uh, I think they were remarkably thoughtful and helpful. Yeah, um, if I could just start and say I completely agree with the points that have been raised, and um, I remember having a conversation some time ago, for instance, with respect to the sources, uh, the citations and judgments and how it's rare to see, you know, any references to whether it's the Maputo Protocol or references to jurisprudence from African countries and so on. And so in a way that's, you know, our role as amici to the court, that's something that, you know, we can certainly take on and ensure that in presenting you know information to the court we're inviting the court to consider um and to not just stick with um it's perhaps one can say um it, it's it's approach that may be rooted in colonial mentality perhaps and so it's important um for not only for us to criticize the court about that but then to be reflective for ourselves to say well what are we when we're doing our research what is it that we're looking at um, and, and so on. And then with respect to the, the domestic implementation, again, I completely agree with you because yes, we can have these beautiful conversations here. Um, but one thing I love to say is that the future of international criminal law is domestic. So it's so important that we see, you know, changes, whether in policy, whether in laws that allow for justice to occur where the crimes um, you know, uh, occurred. And so for me personally, that's part of why I do what I do in terms of capacity building training, in terms of working directly with national stakeholders. And again, tying with what we shared earlier about what could we have done differently? The question of um, would there have been value to, we shouldn't even ask that question, 100% there would have been value, 100% without any doubt. Um, so thank you so much for sharing your points. Yeah, and, and just because it didn't happen doesn't mean it can't happen and shouldn't happen. And we should really take opportunities like this to connect and build relationships to where we would never even have to ask that question in the future. And I, I agree, who's feminist approach? Not only do we need to take intersectional analyses, right? We need to also take critical approaches to international law. We have to take third world approaches to international law. We have to start to question the Western gaze, which Ramya, if she's in the room, is always pushing our students on. It's essential. We can't do this work without engaging in international law that assists everyone. Otherwise, it's continuing then to oppress some and privilege others. And that is what we need to really focus on is how the law itself continues to replicate subjugation, oppression, and privileging in certain circles and certain aspects, right? So that goes from the international level all the way down to the domestic level. And, and I think, Pamela, what you're talking about is so incredi incredibly important. When we look at crimes against humanity, for example, they don't have to be occurring in wartime. It doesn't have to be a conflict. And we limit ourselves often to only seeing crimes against humanity when we are at war or in a conflict situation. But if you think about what is happening to women in almost every context, 
whether they're in conflict or not, it looks a lot like gender-based persecution and domestic violence. We need to start rethinking how we look at what is happening on the ground. At the same time as we need to think about our criminal responses, right? Because we we can't always, as feminists, have a re- reactive criminal response to what is always happening on the ground. We have to think about how are we engaging in healing? How are we engaging the entire community for transformation through law and not just plucking out bad actors or perpetrators, because what that does is is it allows those systems to continue without question. So that's my, my response. And I'm, I'm here if you want to work together. I'll just add one, one more thing, or do we need to wrap up or we? Uh, No, very quickly, if you could add, because I'd like to take one question online as well. Okay. I just wanted to add one more thing, and that is that um, I, I take all the points and also adopt what my colleagues have said. Um, Lily did a really good job at pushing us to think about our sources. And one of the challenges, of course, in working um, in trying to bring a feminist gaze to international law is that so much has been ignored, so much has been uh, silenced over the years. So in, in, in dealing with forced marriage, we went to the traditional sources, which is what the other tribunals have said, but recognize that we can go so much deeper if we go through the human rights lens and bring in more thinking on the human rights side, because like gender-based persecution, forced marriage and and forced pregnancy um, all have a human rights violation aspect to it. And I think we have, there's much more work we can do on that side. Thank you. I'll be very quick because I agree very much with all the comments that you made. Thank you very much and, and the reflections that you made as well. And I would just add to that that perhaps on a very, very individual, very personal level, we need a sense of sort of modesty as well in understanding that our um, gaze um, is indeed very much um, tainted uh, in many of our respects. In mine, it is, um, and that we need to learn and that we need to be mindful. Uh, lessons learned, Victoria. Thank you for your um, reflections. Uh, I'm not quite sure uh, I at least live up to those, uh, but it is something that if we can, like Lady did indeed, uh, help each other to remember, to remind ourselves, and again, have that level of modesty like, hey, we always need to learn, especially in this field, um, we might. <laughs> um, yeah, advance a bit. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. That was all extremely enriching. Um, I'd like to just take one last question from the uh, from what's online. Um, so I think it's a question or a comment, uh, both. So it's basically for Jocelyn, uh, comment that you know there could be other crimes that may fall within the enslavement bucket, including those relating to child soldiers, and that's important because you know we're talking a lot about sexual and gender-based crimes, but of course the victims of those um, are, ca- can be can be many, right? So if you'd like to just uh, address that. Yeah, so I would say yes, there are several acts that you could consider to be evidence of enslavement that occur in the course of enslavement that are also crimes. And so if you think about child soldier uh, situations, those are enslaved children and enslaved girls, boys, all genders, and the way in which violence and, and, and control and ownership are exercised over those child soldiers is evidence of the enslavement, but it's also considered to be a crime of child of conscription and enlisting and, um, and, and forcing children to engage in hostilities. And so we just need to be creative, right? About the way in which we can see, and I think enslavement is a is a systems type crime, right? So this makes it somewhat more difficult to see, but once you start to see it, you can't unsee it. And then you see that a lot of the crimes that are also criminalized under international law are those visible sort of tops or peaks of the iceberg. And what you can then start to look at underneath is how that 
forced pregnancy or how that forced marriage situation on a systematic level is sustained. It's through enslavement and the sexualized violence that happens in the course of enslavement. And so, yes, absolutely. I think it's Indira who asked that question. Yes, there are many other crimes that can fall into what, what we consider an enslavement bucket, but we can also say enslavement is happening. And then in the course of enslavement, all of these other crimes have occurred and they all have separate elements. So you can charge them together, you can convict them together because they, they are uh, reflecting different values and different things that we as an international community say of, offends us all. So the enslavement itself is an offense. And then all of these individual acts that occur during the course of enslavement are also values that we hold dear that we don't want individuals to be harmed by. So that's how I, I see it anyway. Thank you. Um, is there anybody who wanted to add to that? Um, well, well, thank you. I think that probably brings us to the end of the panel. Um, and surprisingly, uh, we're actually on time. Um, <laughs> but, but I mean, of course, I wanted to take a moment just to um, reflect a little bit on maybe what the takeaways, at least for me, were. Um, of course, I think I think we all maybe feel here that the ongoing appeals judgment is obviously a definite step forward um, in the right direction, and it clearly highlights so many important legal issues which are going to be hopefully of use not only at the ICC, but elsewhere and beyond in many different ways. Um, but also I think it highlights, uh, in, you know, in addition to how particular crimes may or may not be interpreted, I think it highlights the approaches that need to be taken, notwithstanding what the crime is. So uh, it could be enslavement, it could be persecution, it could be uh, forced marriage, but the approaches are key. It's uh, important to be nuanced, to be careful, to be respectful, uh, to, to recognize the underlying harm, the protected values, uh, in however we wish to do this work. Um, in terms of, I think, the key sort of tools, I know the gendered lens was uh, mentioned, that is important, the recognition that all crimes to some extent are gendered. Um, and so in that sense, these crimes don't happen in a vacuum. They are the product of the society. And that brings us back perhaps to uh, the opening conversation as well. Uh, and also in terms of recognizing how long this harm extends. Uh, and do they, does, is there really a cutoff date as we see it? And perhaps not. Um, also, I think intersectional approaches are very important. Uh, only because I think it's possibly one way in which one can capture all the multiple competing, intersecting vectors of discrimination, whether it's gender or age or ethnicity or anything else. Uh, it seem, you know, it is an accurate way to describe patterns of victimization. Um, and on this, I would also like to mention, for example, the Office of the Prosecutor recently has a policy on gender persecution, which also I think is an effort to go dig deeper at the sources of discrimination that then sort of propel these crimes forward. Um, I think also um, there is some reflection and I think important reflections and acknowledgements about feminist processes in general, how they work, of course, there are plenty of advantages, uh, but also that they need time, uh, they need uh, reflection, uh, and they certainly need to be inclusive uh, in multiple ways, whether it is uh, to put the voices of the survivors and the victims front and center, whether it is to consult legal experts, local experts, situational experts better, include their voices as well. Uh, so there's lots to learn going forward, and that's definitely my takeaway. Um, and I think in general, um, I think about this a lot, but then I think for everyone who does work on sexual and gender-based crimes, um, we do owe uh, the victims and survivors, um, at least, you know, the, the, uh, the ways in which we make sure that we're careful, that we're sensitive, that we're thorough, that we're gender competent, um, and we're respectful and mindful of, of everything that's connected to those processes. Um, and it is, I think, a fact of life. We're human. We're all products of our societies, of our contexts. Uh, so it is, I think, 
important to be self-aware, to bring that amount of self-reflection uh, to the process, to actively challenge ourselves, to be aware of the biases, stereotypes, discriminatory presumptions that we ourselves sometimes may bring. Um, and, uh, and I think that may be uh, also sort of reflective and a productive way of going forward. Um, so I think on that, I would like to thank uh, very much our fantastic panelists. Uh, you've all been wonderful, given me a lot of food for thought as well. So thank you for that. Uh, thank you to the audience. Thank you for your questions. They were you know, very thoughtful, as well as your observations. Uh, I think we'll take a lot away uh, when we go from here. Uh, but also just looking forward to continuing the conversation. Um, and thanks again to the organizers. I see both Libby, Angela, and everybody else, Jocelyn, um, you know, for bringing this together. So thanks a lot. And we'll, of course, happy to talk later as well. Thank you. And thank you, Priya, for an excellent moderating of this panel. Really, you are the expert in and of you know the the group of experts that are that are sitting here at the table. So um, now we'll have we'll break for lunch, so everyone can meet back here. I think it's I'm looking at one fifteen. So we'll reconvene at one fifteen. But please take some time if you have to make calls, if you have to use the restroom, do that now, and we'll reconvene after lunch. Thank you. 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 Thank you.